Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Benjamin Franklin. Welcome to the Guyana Dialogue. I'm your hostess, Shamisa Ali. Good evening to everyone joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Wishing everyone a relaxing weekend and a full um, week ahead of us. Tonight, our discussion will be on the power of the speaker, the suspension of parliamentarians and the national image of parliament. The Guyana Dialogue is being sponsored by a coordinating council of Guyanese based in the U.S., U.K., Canada, Guyana, and the Caribbean. Funding support is by well-known philanthropist Dave Narine from Dave West Indian Imports. Please welcome my moderator for tonight, Dr. Tara Singh. Good evening, uh, Dr. Tara, and welcome. Thank you very much, Samiza. Good evening. Good evening to all the panelists, um, and welcome to the speaker. I'm not seeing him. Right we will bring him on in just a little bit. Let me do the intro. And our panelist yeah, yeah. is Mahindra Hariraj. He was born November 14, 1955 in Albaistong, where he lived during his childhood and early adult life. He attained a master's degree in economics from the University of Manchester. He also has a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Alberta, which is in Canada. He has, he has 40 years checkered political career, working against the grain to represent people and to bring development and social upliftment. He was a former five terms member of parliament, first being elected in 1992 after the October 5th general elections and a two term cabinet minister. He is committed to continued service to his country and its people and will continue to work in fostering opportunities so that our people can realize their fullest potential and the enjoyments of the fruits of their efforts. Please welcome the Honorable Mansoor Nadir. Thank you very much, Ms. Ali. Pleasure Dr. having Singh. you here this evening. And Dr. Tara, you can continue. Yeah. Um Welcome, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Um, since you were appointed, I never had an opportunity to speak to you. I know I met you in the previous administration when you were Minister of Labor. Um, you shared our office um, adjacent to the then Minister of... Not Minister... Um, not, you are not Minister of Labor. You are Minister of... Um, was it? Yes, I was Minister of Labor. Okay, right. I met you then. and um, uh, So... We extend our warmest congratulations to you. And I know the job of a speaker is very, very um, telling, especially in a diverse, complex um, social situation as in Guyana. But so far, we've been monitoring and watching your performance. You're very cool, relaxed, and um, that is very good. Um, we need people with sober temperament to be in that position. Now. Uh, we, we want you to start off to just tell us a little about some of the powers you have uh, as speak of the assembly. Then we'll go on to ask some, some additional questions. With me here, we have Mahendra, who is um, uh, a community activist over here, and he's an accountant by profession. And Dr. Ganga Ramdas, who you should know, he was a former head of a desk at the Bank of Guyana. He became a um, a professor at Lincoln University. He was head of the Department of Economics and International Relations. He's He will come on shortly. and So you can please proceed and welcome again to the Ghana Dialogue. And again, thank you, Ms. Ali, Dr. Singh, uh, Mr. Hemraj. It's an honor for, be, for me to be on the program. And good evening to all of your viewers. And I know you have a very wide cross-section of the people watching and across many nations. And thanks for having me on the program. The Speaker of the National Assembly, the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, and also the Clerk and Deputy Clerk, the Constitution of Guyana, in fact, Article 56, speaks to the establishment of the Office of Speaker of the National Assembly. 
and there are other articles in the Constitution which prescribes how the Speaker is elected and how the Speaker continue to serve in the National Assembly. Let me, let me also welcome Dr. Ramdas. Good evening to you. So the Speaker has uh, its local standard for the lawyers. The power resides in the Constitution of Ghana. And the Constitution prescribes how the Speaker is elected. And we can go into that if later in the program. But the powers of the Speaker, the rules of Parliament, are derived from the powers in the Constitution as prescribed and also what is called the standing orders of the National Assembly. And that's the rule book. The rule book of the procedures that we have to follow in the National Assembly. There is also conventions. And these conventions are well documented in the Bible for parliamentary procedure in the Westminster system. And that is the volumes done by Erskine May, who was for a number of years, a couple of centuries ago, the clerk of the UK parliament and went on to document the uh, rulings of the House of Commons and started developing the, the Bible on running especially Westminster Parliament. I think in America you may follow more the Roberts principles mm -hmm. in terms of governing your Congress, your state legislatures, and also the Senate. So the powers of the Speaker are prescribed, documented, and detailed in these three uh, publications. Primarily, the Speaker of the Parliament has the power to ensure that there is order in the Assembly, that the business of the Assembly proceeds, and wide-ranging powers in terms of debate, language use, in terms of um, the exercise of discretion. In fact, Article 165 of our Constitution says that the Parliament of Guyana shall prescribe its own rules. So these rules of Parliament um, have been developed coming out of strong traditions and also we have a history of the Parliament of Guyana, well detailed in our standing orders. And one of the principles which have guided Westminster systems is that the speaker or the person in the chair in particular uh, has a lot of discretion. And the rulings of speakers are not easily challenged. If, if members of parliament are not satisfied with rulings, they can bring a formal motion to be debated in the House. So these are well-documented, well-prescribed, time-tested rules in terms of the power of the speaker. But what has been very sacrosanct is the decisions of the speaker. And so parliaments around the world, Australia, New Zealand, especially the Westminster system as speaker of, and up to recently the British House of Commons looked at this discretionary power which the speaker has. And every time it's examined, it is always the same conclusion. We should not interfere with the speaker's ability to use his 
or her own judgment in making decisions. And in terms of that, much change in terms of the discretion of the speaker in terms of applying the standing orders and the constitution, that discretion like a judge. And in this case, um, the unless a procedures prescribed in the constitution, Article 165 again speaks to the parliament making its own rules. So in that regard, the speaker, yes, is very powerful. I'm not going to say all powerful because in the end, the speaker has to exercise fairness, impartiality, and in exercising both of that, many persons will test the patience, the fairness, the impartiality of the speaker by pushing the buttons. And so at some time, the speaker will have to now bring in the other word, firmness in the house in order to maintain order and to proceed with the business of the people of the parliament. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, parliament is the highest institution in the country, um, but parliament is supposed to set an example. We have been watching at various debates on how members have uh, not conducted themselves civilly civilly or in accordance with parliamentary protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the case where many of them were suspended, if you can comment on that. It gives a bad image um, to the country. Um, so how do you plan to deal with that? And if you can offer some comments on that. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, first, let me just make a distinction between parliament and the National Assembly. Okay. The constitution prescribes that there shall be a parliament of Guyana consisting of His Excellency and the National Assembly. So when we use parliament, we use the word parliament synonymously with National Assembly. Mm -hmm. But parliament actually is the combined offices of the president and the National Assembly. Because remember, uh, whatever bills are passed in Parliament cannot become law until assented mm. to by His Excellency. So the president has a power of veto of any bill, plus um, refuse to um, sign bills that may have um, been passed that the president is not in agreement with. So that is a distinction. But in terms of the National Assembly, what we'll speak about is the National Assembly this evening, which is just a part of Parliament. Yes, in the exercise of the powers to ensure that there is a Parliament that is respectful, that is uh, doing the business of the people, one would have many times to call members to the books. And since the 12th parliament began on uh, two years ago, uh, we have seen many challenges to the rulings and also the procedures in parliament. Some would say, and, and I have some amount of sentiments with that position that uh, militancy is the order of politics. Militancy. And when people speak of militancy, it's all kinds of actions, aggressive actions, to pressure case. And at the beginning of the 12th Parliament, and I said to the House at the time that the new era that we have today is one of people continuously watching in real time. And so we do have your members of parliament under scrutiny 
especially when the host meets. And that could be good and that could be bad because on the other side, on the one hand, people will see what is being discussed, can get involved. On the other hand, some members of parliament may want to use that international and national platform to press their case and to show how tough they are. So what has happened is, I said, look, we have a society where the majority in this parliament has always been a thin one, a one-seat majority for the longest while. And for me, winning over and getting a majority would require members of parliament to demonstrate civility, decency, and perhaps more particularly, a face to the public and actions to the public that will instill confidence that this member or the party which they represent should be in a majority and form the government. So that was my first uh, remarks to the parliament. And almost a month after we saw the buttons being pushed, one former opposition leaders referred on one program saying that the speaker should not be anybody's little boy and tara i think you and i are older than shamisa and hemraj but you and i know many times when people do things and say things they mean more than the advice they're giving you so very early we saw this militancy button and challenging button being pressed. I have no problems with that. Once you're within the rules of parliament, I will listen, I have the opportunity to rebut, and so I shall rule using the principles of the standing orders, the constitution, and what I consider my fairest and best judgment on behalf of the entire parliament. All right, thank you. I Okay, go ahead. So it's not the first time that members misbehave in parliament. It was not the first occasion of disorder in the house. December 29th, 2021 was perhaps the limit. Previously, we had the honorable member Sherrod Duncan entered into parliament and there's a rule that members of parliament should make their contributions from the seat. He entered the parliament and started a shouting match while another member was on the floor. And despite and in spite of my exhortation to that honorable member to take his seat, right? I stood when the speaker stands in parliament, everyone who is standing should sit and listen. And that refusal happened was total defiance by this honorable member. And so he was the first suspension we had. On December 29th, it happened en masse. And so those who were involved, not only in the gross disorder of parliament, but those who were disordered, those who were involved in destroying public property to the tune of almost $400,000. But that was the least of it. It was a member getting into the control room, ripping out cables and the technical equipment to prevent the live broadcast of parliament by destroying the public property. And then there was the verbal abuse by one member of parliament to a member of staff. And all those are covered in the standing orders. And so we, I, I ask that condign action be taken against them. And I ask the Honorable Minister Teixeira to move that motion that these members be sent to the Committee of Privileges. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, 
do you have a training program in Parliament for parliamentarians? Because my sense is many of them might not be acquainted with the standing orders, the protocols, etc. Um, what is your comment on that? We do have the first, um, as soon as a new parliament is elected, the clerk would organize a training session for the members of parliament, go through standing orders, go through rules. And so that was done. But also political parties do have a mix of experienced persons and young, fresh, well, I shouldn't say young alone, but fresh faces. And there is what is called a chief whip. And the political parties also would do their own uh, orientations. But we did have that training program. And because we had COVID, we weren't able to do another training program, which we would normally do. And that is to get the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the 53 odd countries of the former British Empire are still band together under the umbrella of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. And they would normally do a training program for members of parliament. And while we have had a lot of online um, exposure, we weren't able to do the formal, physical, face-to-face -face program with the CPA until May of this year. And so, yes, we had another program in May. But outside of that, what we have been able to do um, was to increase our activities in international fora, the Americans may say forums, that Guyana's parliament is affiliated to. For example, the parliament of the OAS, what is called Parle Americas. All the countries of the Americas are involved in that. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and there is another grouping called the International Parliamentary Union, which we are part of and covers 178 countries. And we do have that wide pool to pull from. So the issue of persons not knowing, for me, is a non-issue because you have one, your party that you represent would normally assist through their formal mechanisms and the chief whip. Parties like the joiner party, yes, they don't have um, that luxury of experienced people. And so they will rely on guidance and in particular, the clerk of the parliament. The staff of the parliament, the clerk, the deputy clerk, our table officers, um, they're open to any member of parliament at any time for advice, for guidance, for the construction of motions and questions. And that has happened full time in the past two years. All right, thank you. I now pass you on to Mahindra. Please ask your question, two thank, questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. Starr. Um, good evening, uh, Speaker Nadir. It's a privilege to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you. Given that Guyana is on the forefront of this global uh, transformation, um, behavior and actions in the parliament is closely looked at, as Dr. Tara alluded to. And given that there is a level of incivility from one rogue group, I had an opportunity to glance through maybe the standing orders and while you ascribe that there is discretionary power within your armory, I did not see in the standing order in particular two articles or two chapters. There were anything prescriptive as for reprimand or a course of action for specific behavior. Uh, given the constitutional reform is on the way, are we looking to strengthen these areas as to how the conduct of members should be and what the repercussions would be if they don't act in a particular way? Okay, there are uh, three submissions I would make to provide information with respect to your observation. One, we do have a handbook 
that is given to every member of parliament. And that handbook would detail what is expected uh, behavior, dress code, decorum, and a number of other issues to help members of parliament along. That's one. Two, there is a mechanism for reprimand. First, if a member is going to behave disorderly, and I should say gross disorderly in the house, the speaker has the power on the spot to suspend that person immediately from the city. If it's, if it's unbearable, the speaker can call on a minister and ask the minister to move that immediately that this member be suspended for 10 months, for two sittings, right? So that is prescribed in the standing order. Outside of that, if persons, members mislead, if they uh, provide false information and charges, the gross disorder, the speaker can call on a minister to move a motion that the errant members be sent to a, the Committee of Privileges. And the Committee of Privileges have the ability to make recommendations, which could include the expulsion of a member from the House. So there is a mechanism prescribing the standing orders. And when that, when the committee meets and concludes on the issues before it, a report goes to the Parliament and that report if adopted, would now allow for the impositions of the necessary or the recommended sanctions. Thank, thank you for that answer. Um, I know that some members was recently suspended for this very rogue behavior. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the entire world is waiting for Parliament to resume for recess. What would you say, Guyana, next phases in parliamentary business under your stewardship can can look forward to I, you spoke about impartiality you spoke about the balance of your formness uh how do you see diana mobilizing through this phase where we are seeing major transformation global tremors global impact and obviously we are fitting into a, a world stage now hemorrhage excellent the image of a country from every angle of the state, be it the judiciary, the executive, or the legislative, is taken into account when people look at that country for investment, for example, for tourism. And so whatever we do in parliament, in the judiciary, in the executive, whatever we do has implications locally, regionally, and internationally. Uh, AG and I just returned from Rwanda, a country where over a hundred million people, sorry, over a million people were slaughtered in a hundred days. And if you do the math, that's literally 10,000 persons a day. And 30 years later, we see a Rwanda that has, yes, still deep wounds, but a lot of healing has happened there. And when you look at Rwanda and we ask, what is making Rwanda the fastest growing economy in the continent? And the ordinary people will tell you, good leadership. That's what they came up with, good leadership. And they weren't only speaking to the issue of the President um, Kagani, his, but they also spoke of the other aspects of the state and governance. So it has tremendous amount of implications. You know, in 20, 2006, sorry, 2011, 
we had an American investor who had spent two years looking at uh, high-speed freight train from Lethem to Burbies. And when they, um, when, when I saw the proposal, the amount of work that they had done um, was amazing. Just from desk reviews of Guyana and interacting with some people. And after the elections of November 2011, they scrapped the program. And th that's, this investor had then $500 million in cash because he had sold half of the empire he had and wanted to try new things. And then he and his partner said, um, it's hard to risk one and a half billion dollars um, with uncertainty. All right, so, Dr. Ganga, your turn now. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mansur Nasir and members of the Guyana Dialogue. I'm very happy to learn about the rules of the speaker that goes beyond that of an umpire and also a professor in the classroom. So our, our rules-based system, plus, as you intimated, um, with the impartiality rather than, let's say, a confrontational approach, has the other dimension of a, a behavioral-based system as well. So that, that helps us and gives us flexibility to do your job and for the public to uh, appreciate the the high value that you bring to to the community and especially to Guyana and its image. Now, I uh, have been trying to follow some of the events. Some already have been mentioned, but there is one particular um, area that um, I have an interest, uh, and that is when a motion is uh, brought before the assembly, um, the, there's the original motion, then there's, uh, there would be changes, and then there will be the final, final motion. So could you uh, explain that a little bit more to see how we arrive at the final version of the motion? Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ramdas. Uh, first, when a motion or a question comes to the to the speaker, the clerk would first check that motion against the rules. So there are prescribed rules in terms of how questions should be and motions should be formulated, including the issue of being factual in the preambles that precede the resolves or including the, the words which will build up towards a question. And so it would be checked against and the standing orders do have clear guidelines with respect to how motions should be worded and how questions should be worded and asked. There were clear rules. And so there's something called a table officer. So when you're tabling a motion or a question, it or a bill goes to the table officer, it is checked by the clerk, and the clerk would normally send an opinion to the speaker saying, it's checked against the standing orders, everything is okay, or there are some infactual statements. Uh, you can't ask that the committee uh, investigate and at the same time approbate. So it's checked. Now the speaker has the power to reject the motion, to amend the motion, or to allow the motion or the question to go as presented. 
And we've had over 500 questions and information that have been presented. And so about 10% of the questions are not allowed because of a number of reasons. It might be subjudiciary, it might contain infactual information, it may have resolved which um, the parliament cannot consider, or it may have addressed an issue that had been already addressed in the National Assembly. So we we'll go through all of that. If it doesn't meet the criteria, I would normally ask these, um, the clerk to write the member and give our observations. I hesitantly amend a question or motion. So the, the, the mover gets an opportunity to do their own amendment so that the motion or question can comply with the standing orders. And if a member will take three months or four months that we submit, many times some members, especially on the other side, will say the speaker had this motion for eight months and make try to make political mileage from it. But as speaker, I don't conduct the business of the house in the public. I do it in the house. And so I can accept those criticisms. In fact, they are standing orders which speaks to not criticizing rulings of the speaker in public. And I'll give you a, a, an example. So you have that. And sometimes I would have made a ruling and one is going to come up shortly. And a ruling was made and, um, and a member of parliament still brings a motion on my ruling for sanctions against somebody. In that case, the matter was dealt with and it was dealt with within the session and I wasn't going to allow it to happen. So here again, there is a lot of powers within the speaker to look at questions and motions and disallow them. But with great restraint, I would tend to send those back to the movers for their amendments. And I was, um, I told you I was going to come back to one in the House of Commons. If you do something that the speaker is not happy about, the speaker would not recognize you at all. You could stand and shout his name and he would just wouldn't recognize you. And the convention there is that the speaker sits in a particular chair in let's, their lounge and you go and whisper to the the speaker, can I buy you a coffee? And that's the form of apology that they have practiced for centuries. And when uh, that apology is made to the speaker, then um, that person is recognized. And the rule is, whoever catches the eye of the speaker first, he shall call, unless there is a speaking list that is presented to the speaker on any subject that's coming up. Unlike your system where if I get 15 minutes to address Congress on an issue, I can give Tara two, I can give Shamiz two, and I can give him March five. We don't have that in our system. So when the speaker calls on you, you can't tell him I'm deferring to Tara. No calls on you if you're not listed and it's who, re who the speaker recognize you have to speak the other burning question i had was quorum uh, especially when the opposition decides to walk out i i think i saw article 169 uh, as i was reading uh, how do you tackle that situation the quorum for the National Assembly, I think is 22 members. Um, and it doesn't say that you should have 10 of those from the opposition and 12. So um, I think it's one third 
of the parliament. So once there's one third, and the staff will indicate to me that we have a quorum. So many times when parliament is on at 10 a.m., the house doesn't have enough people in the house at the time, nor are they online because since COVID, we can also join online. So the, the staff would monitor and technically I'm literally outside the curtain waiting sometimes 15 minutes and half an hour for a quorum. So they'll say we have a quorum, then um, they'll press what is called the third bell and I'll come in and take the necessary courtesies and say that um, the, this session of the house is duly constituted and in order. And normally you'd have three bells. There'll be a bell about 15 minutes before just to let people know that the time for the convening of parliament is fast approaching. Then there's a next bell that normally is about five minutes before. And then there's a third bell that is rung immediately before the speaker enters. So there is a warning system to get people to ensure that they are present. All right, thank you, sir. Um, quickly, um, what are the opposition chances of passing um, or tabling a bill in parliament? Do they have special days in a session dedicated to opposition motions or bills? A anybody, opposition, individuals can table bills, yes. Um, in the house but we had made a change some time ago that every fourth sitting of the national assembly it will be opposition day where opposition business is priority on the agenda every fourth sitting the opposition gets priority so this is a mechanism to ensure that on a periodic basis the opposition can proceed with business which they want to bring before the house and so we do have a mechanism to address opposition business as a priority in fact you don't have to wait on that if a, if an agenda item if the opposition business is on the agenda and the government business is finished, you can deal with the opposition business. But there is a priority date. Yes. Dr. His, his voice is not being heard. Uh, he had to ah, unmute. Okay. You're here now? Yes. Yeah, okay. You said that parliament comprises the president and the assembly. So who is the head of parliament? The speaker is the head of parliament. Okay, thank you. Now, Mahendra, your question. Quick question, uh, Speaker uh, Nadir. You spoke about formalities and expected behavior. Um, given the important role you have at the APEC institution as um, heading the assembly, what security measures are you looking or exploring to prevent maybe something reoccurring that we saw in the world saw um, uh, in December? Um, given there, you know, there is you know breach of protocols, the sergeant of arm. Uh, we saw staff lying on the ground being stumbled upon. What security measures are being put in place aside from all of the formal expected protocol? Mahendra, another excellent observation. We have been toying with, I shouldn't say toying, we have been uh, dealing with the issue of security at all levels in Parliament for some time. And even before I as I became speaker, we've had visits to different parliaments, including Trinidad, because after the 
assault on parliament by the Jamaat al Muslimin, they had to beef up their security and so forth. And one of the, the biggest challenge challenges that we have is the real possibility that over exuberant supporters of one group or another can storm the parliament. And that is every time you have a session at that parliament or any member of parliament is in the public buildings where people frequent literally every day, there is that explosion. And we continue to look at some of the mechanisms that can be put in place. I know at a sitting, and we are not the security experts, we have to take the guidance from the Guyana police force. And so um, I'll give you a couple of examples. They, there are barriers that are established at different intervals before you get to the parliament. And that's real. Like in every battle, you'll have defenses at different levels. So they have the, the Georgetown traveling public, the commuters are happy that we are not conducting parliament at public buildings for the time being because of the chaos cause around that Stabrook High Street area. And we have had to move the barriers still to Smite Street, two corners away in instances. I remember um, when President, the late Janet Jagan, was addressing Parliament for the first time after she was elected, that um, the crowd stormed her car when she was leaving the Parliament. And literally for about two hours, whoever was in Parliament was literally held hostage. This is not figment of my imagination. This is reality that we have faced before. So the Ghana police force works out some protocols and some security arrangements. And only just before we, con we, we went into recess, an observation was made about a uh, firearm by one of our staffers, licensed firearm, right? And that firearm not being lodged. At the entrance in the strong box. And so the commander under which we fall called and said this was the observation, and we took immediate corrective action. Now, let's look again at what has happened. Indira Gandhi wasn't killed by a, a mob storming her home one of her own persons assassinated her. And if you look at the CBC report done in 1970s, there's a little booklet called Assassination and Terrorism. And they'll tell you the first thing in places centuries ago, the assassins will tell you that we will get you and the example there was raised that at eight o'clock, Idi Amin carried a gun in his waist to basically say, you come for me, I'll at least get one or two. And when Rajiv Gandhi was running again, the security told him, you can't be so close to the people. And he said, um, well, this is the criticism. My security has kept me too far from the people. And he was embraced by a, a human bomb. Now somebody will say, Mansur, what nonsense you're talking. We're in Guyana. Yeah, are we? <laughs> I know 176 persons were killed in conflict in this country and a thousand maimed. I know that we had in the Caribbean two coups in Grenada. In 1980 in Jamaica, 800 persons were killed in electoral upheavals. In Dominica, 
Patrick John regime, St. Lucia, John Compton's regime. We have seen a president of Haiti and they still can't come out of their troubles and even close to home, the assassination of a minister. All that happened in the last 60 years, which is a, a, a mosquito wing in the annals of time. So that question, Mahendra, is something that lingers with us all the time. I'm confident that I can say every single public official is exposed to this, especially those at the highest level. And so we have to be concerned. We have to be security conscious and more particularly, at least try to minimize the incidents that will happen when they happen. Every single day, I shouldn't say every day, but I think in America, you have over 400 mass shootings already for the year. And I think we've recently seen uh, a gunman around a school in Trinidad. So this is no walk in the park or apple pie business. This is the people's business and the health and safety of everyone and security is of major concern. You have a follow-up question, Mahendra? No follow-up question. That was one of my concerns with respect to okay. security. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ganga, your final question. Well, this was quite revealing, both about internal uh, corridors of security and also what you vividly described as the external, the need for external corridors of security. Um, the the second one overrides what I was going to ask about the internal. So I, I would skip the internal, which is just uh, uh, how you to deal with the extreme behavior internally. Uh, two things come to mind there, reconsideration or withdrawal of, of whatever the, the grievance was, and then meet with the in the in-house meeting or closed-door meeting with the, with the two uh, uh, whips from both sides. Uh, this is based on uh, teaching experience. You, you have a meeting with whatever the matter is, but you have a, a charismatic or a more powerful uh, person sitting there. So that sends home the message and it leads to a solution. So I think um, we, we can learn from what's going on and the way you've vividly described these events. Uh, our future leaders can um, take note and learn from your experience as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ramdas. And yes, there is a consensus table in the speaker's office. So when we have issues in the house, we could suspend get two representatives and the chief whip from each side and we sign sit around the table and come up with a way forward so that has been employed by speakers long before me i have benefited from being the minister of labor knowing that you have to bring people to the table many times and once you come to the table everyone has to leave with something Dr. Tara. Dr. Tara, your audio needs to be on. Yeah. Shamiza, um, Mr. Speaker, we pass you on now to Shamiza, our host, and she will likely ask her three questions from our viewers before we close the program. Thank you. Shamiza. Thank you, Dr. Tara. I'm not sure we have three questions, but I'll try my best to ask you the questions we do have. Uh, with women positions that we have seen are, are across uh, the ministers um, within the government now, we saw a lot of female ministers. Is there a possibility that we might see a female speaker uh, in the future? That's a very strong possibility. Guyana has been in the forefront of uh, gender equity um, for a long time, decades. Uh, her honor, Deshi Bernard, 
Justice Bernard, who have been one of the leading women at the Beijing conference. Um, we've just moved up a few notches in terms of our dealing with the gender issue. Yes, there will be a female speaker, in my view, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, why, when the opposition was making noise and misbehaving, why weren't the police called in? And I think that was a question while you were giving a statement earlier, it was asked. Uh, there were a lot of considerations, and including our search for security is um, the consideration that we have our own martial code in the National Assembly. When the police is called in, the police has a different command and obey system. So to call in the police, you go to the top person in charge, it comes down. When ranks are given their orders, the same system has to follow. Uh, so we would prefer to be with a security mechanism to maintain order in the house that I should say I would, that we would continue to be in charge of in real time. So a martial code is one of the issues that we are recommending because if a person is asked to leave and they do not leave, you would have to suspend and physically remove them. Once a person is suspended, however, they're not entitled to come within the precincts, precincts of the parliament. So at that stage, at the beginning of every session, we will say, Shemiza, Tara, Mahendra, Ganga have been suspended. They're not allowed to enter. And the Ghana police force enforces that on the outside of the compound. Um, this is probably a follow-up. Uh, how many times a member could be suspended before they get kicked out of parliament permanently? Again, gross disorder and if behavior will be uh, such that you can't tolerate to have that person back in the house, yes. I would move that that person be taken to the privilege committee and expelled. So Expel. that would be a very rare, rare, rare decision um, for that under my stewardship as speaker to be happening. Thank you for answering those questions. Honorable Minister, uh, we will give you now about a few minutes for you to, for your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Ms. Ali, Dr. Singh, Dr. Ramdas, Mr. Hemraj. It's been a great honor for me to appear in your program. I know the dialogue has been doing great service in terms of providing information, especially to the diaspora but quite a few persons who are resident right here in our country do watch this program. What we have and I have done is to ask that we move parliament closer to the people by providing more information to many of our citizens, including the diaspora. And so we have introduced last year and we had the second one the Speaker's National Youth Debating Competition that brings in young people from all regions of the country. We do a, another program where we take Christmas cheers out to children under 10, but we provide them with some of the books, the symbols of parliament, uh, coloring books, light reading materials. Um, we have had the youth parliament continuing from previous speakers Next year, we're going to do more physical outreaches. Just as we are meeting people here and providing information, we'll do that physically in communities. I've been using sport as another mechanism of introducing Parliament, uh, what Parliament does, how you can access Parliament, how you can access your MPs, outside of what the parties and the MPs do. We will embark. We have embarked on that as another 
menu in the measures to bring parliament closer to the people. Uh, finally, our international agenda has put Guyana's parliament at a very high ranking and consideration in international forum. Where parliament to parliament and parliament to parliamentary organizations is concerned, the House, the Speaker, has some amount of abilities to engage. But foreign policy is a purview of the executive. So where parliament to parliament engagement has happened, we continue to have a pretty aggressive program because after the two years of contact, people have changed. You want to establish friends to build democracy around the world, to support issues on climate change, on gender equity and youth and women. Those issues you can learn from each other. And I happen to also, where the International Parliamentary Union is concerned, co-chair the engagement of that big body with the World Trade Organization. Myself and a member of the European Parliament are the two co-chairs. We're going off to Argentina to deal with the WTO and parliaments on WTO issues in another three weeks. So what we have done is to strengthen the ability of our parliament to engage people and to represent the Guyanese parliament in Guyana at international fora. We've also used, similar to you, uh, social media, and we, we're getting quite a few million hits now at all levels because the youth debating competition is stimulating a lot of interest among young people. We have two sessions of the youth parliament, one for high school students, one for older youth. We have the sporting competition, the on the 10, and people are logging into the social media platforms that we have. So in this regard, I would say um, so far I'm satisfied with what has been done and we will continue to improve so that we can make the business of the Guyanese parliament available and exposed to one another. At the same time, educate our people on how they can use effectively the democratic institution of parliament for the benefit of the people. And I want to say thank you very much for having me on the program. And thank you to your great uh, supporter, philanthropist, Mr. Dave Narayan and Dave West Indian Imports for doing this program. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank, thank you. you to our, our entire panel, our moderator for tonight. And thank you so much to our viewers uh, for being interactive, being respectful. Until next time. This is the Guyana Dialogue. Good evening. Thank you, thank you very much. You. Very interesting session. We thank you very much. I thank hope you.